John now Doug Hoff. Thank you, Justin. So this is the last part of 2019. 2019 was a very special year to me because in 1969, I wrote my first program as an engineer. Uh, back in those days, there were no such things as professional software engineers or professional programmers. If you did programming, it was because you needed something for your own use. And, but 1969 was a bunch of other things. For the first time, people stepped off of this planet onto the moon, and the world came to a halt. It didn't make any difference whether you were in China or Russia or South Africa or any other place in the world. You were glued in front of a television set to watch this triumph of humankind. Another place, Woodstock happened. And a world of music became about with bands that were the launching at Woodstock. And a whole series of people came together just to have a good time in this small farm in New York City. In New York City, the Stonewall Inn was a gay place for gay people to hang out and have a drink and good time. Periodically, these places were raided by police and people were put into paddy wagons, taken to jail, and embarrassed. But this time something happened and they fought back, you know, and the beginning of the LGBTQ community started. In New Jersey, two people got together just to create this little operating system for themselves, just for fun. One man had been working on a project called Multics that was being worked on by General Electric, uh, AT&T, and a series of other companies. And he was taken off of that project because the telephone company was concerned that the government would think that this was too far for the monopoly because, after all, why would a telephone company need computers? But... Ken Thompson came back to New Jersey, found a cast-off PDP-7 computer, started this little project and enlisted a whole bunch of people at Bell Labs, and Unix was started. Independent of all that, the Internet was started as a project called the ARPANET, funded by DARPA as a research project to create a network that would stand up in case of disaster. Atomic blast, wars, stuff like that that would reroute all the packets to be able to maintain communications. And today, the internet works mostly the way that it was intended, thanks to God and Al Gore. <laughs> In Helsinki, Finland, little known, little noticed, except by the, his parents, Linus Torvalds was born. We'll hear more about him later. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's funny because I first met Linus when he was a 21-year-old college student. Now he's 50. That makes me feel incredibly old. <laughs> <laughs> I already mentioned the fact I wrote my first program back then. I started off being an electrical engineer, but I was almost electrocuted by 13,600 volts and 800 amps. And I decided that software programming was a lot safer. Worst thing that could happen was a paper cut from a card. And 1969 was also the last year I ever shaved. <laughs> now you'll notice a little asterisk beside Mad Dog's beard. That indicates that there is a story that's related to that. As we go through this talk, you'll see more asterisks. And if there's more than just one asterisk, it means it's a longer story. <laughs> and maybe even better story. And if you get me drunk enough, I'll even tell it to you. So keep track of the asterisk if you have an interest in it. So I'm going to take you back in time, the time of 1969, when computers were physically huge, okay, but logically very small and very slow. They might cost $2.5 million for a computer system that would have all of one quarter megabyte of RAM memory. Or it wasn't RAM, it was core memory. 
This were measured in megabytes, not gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, but just megabytes. In fact, at one point in my career, I had to practice saying the word gigabyte to try and figure out how big that really was, right? <laughs> Programs were run one at a time. You didn't have an operating system, even on some mainframes, there was no operating system. The device drivers that control the devices were actually linked into the program you wrote. And then you would boot that program one at a time. Initial program load, IPL, to load that program into the computer and run it. And if there was an operating system, it was typically written to try and help you, the user, use your computer to be more efficient because after all, this cost $2.5 million when a million dollars was a lot of money. You know? And there's, there's a rumor that people created, a, an urban legend if you wish, that companies created these different operating systems to lock their customers in to make sure that their customers couldn't go to a competitor system. Now I will tell you, I've been in the computer industry for 50 years. And I never heard that conversation even one time. Our conversations were, how can we make this thing more efficient so our customers can use this incredibly expensive, incredibly small, logically, incredibly slow machine. And if it was the fact that we were creating these operating systems to lock our customers into our particular hardware, our particular system, we would only need one operating system on each one of these pieces of hardware. In reality, the DEC PDP-11, as an example, had over 11 different operating systems. We had an operating system for real-time, an operating system for time-sharing, an operating system that did soft real-time and time-sharing. We had an operating system for education, an operating system for health. We had two different versions of Unix, all on this one piece of hardware. And if we only wanted to lock our customers in, we would have given you just one and said, use it. So all the conversations I had, and talk about you know, competition between customers. I was on the board of directors for Usenix for a long time, and we would have meetings where engineers from Sun and engineers from DEC and engineers from IBM and Hewlett Packard and all the rest would get together and talk about how to make Unix better. We would cooperate, we'd share information with each other. Of course, there were certain things you wanted to keep a little bit private because that was gonna be the thing that you would announce, but in a lot of other cases, we would work together. Standards were another place where we would work together to create better standards. And today, that's still very, very important. Most of the software back in those days was distributed in source code form because there were no real professional programmers per se. If you were interested in computers, it was because you were a physicist or you were a chemist or you were an educator, and you were writing code for your own use. And after you got that code written, you'd say, oh, what am I gonna do with this, right? Because selling software is hard work. People expect you to have documentation. They expect bug fixes. They expect that you're gonna change the software somehow to make it better for them instead of just for you. And so these people said, hey, I'm going to contribute my software to one of these libraries. DECUS, the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society, share the same thing for IBM, brainstorm for Novell, and so forth and so on. And these libraries would put out catalogs, paper catalogs. I remember sending away $15 as a university student to receive this very thick paper catalog back in the U.S. Postal Mail that I would go through and I would see what programs were available to me to run on my little computer systems. And some of those programs would cost $5 because they had to be punched on the paper tape and mailed to you and stuff. $5 was a lot of money back in those days because $5 could buy you 10 pitchers of beer. And as a college student, I had this problem, you know, should I get a, a text editor, 
a cool text editor, or 10 pitchers of beer. And I think you can see what direction I would normally go. But the thing was that this was not copyrighted software. You couldn't copyright software back in those days. You could, there was no software patents. You couldn't patent software. And so you were free to copy this. And not only that, but you were encouraged to copy it. You were encouraged by these user groups to make copies. So I would go to the school store and I would buy some paper tape and I would put it in my ASR33 teletype, which copied it at the rate of five bytes or characters a second. I hesitate to say the word byte because back in those days we didn't have a standard for a byte. It was not eight bits. Sometimes it was six bits and sometimes it was five bits and sometimes it was eight bits. We didn't really have a standard back in those days, but it was about that speed. And I would make 10 copies of this software and I would sell it to my roommates for a dollar a piece. And after a while, I made back my $5 for the text editor and my 10 pitchers of beer. So in reality, I was the first red hat. <laughs> So, as I said, in 1969, there were these two guys, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie of Bell Labs in New Jersey, and they decided that they just wanted to create this little operating system for fun. And they were going to create a much smaller kernel than typically happened, because back in those days, a lot of the functionality of the operating system happened in what most people would call the kernel or the executive or whatever. It was operating at privileged mode. And they said, no, 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 let's, let's make a smaller kernel and let's put a lot of this functionality out in user space. And this made the kernel a lot easier to make and a lot easier to get it right, whatever get it right meant. Uh, originally, it was written in machine language for the PDP-7. Only the PDP-7 they had was so small that it couldn't self-host its own assembler. So they had to go over to another computer system with a cross-assembler, write the code on that, cross-assemble it, take the paper tape over to the PDP-7, try and get it to run, and of course it would crash in the first 15 seconds. And then they would use the lights and switches on the front of the PDP-7 to do the debugging of the kernel. Eventually they got it working on the PDP-7, but the PDP-7 was so small and so slow, it ran out of steam. So they decided to move to another larger, newer system called the PDP-11, also made by digital. But they didn't have the money for that. And their department said, hey, this is just like a research kind of fun project. We're not going to spend the $250,000 it would take to buy, a, a, or even, even more, a reasonable size PDP-11. So they went around Bell Labs looking for somebody that would fund this. And eventually they found the one department inside of Bell Labs that had to have, that seemed to have almost unlimited money. Money out the wazoo. Now you might think, oh, that's the engineering lab, no. Research lab, no. Facilities lab, no. It was the legal department. And Ken and Dennis convinced the legal department that they were going to create this operating system so lawyers could sit down and write their legal briefs and format it, right? And this is one reason why Unix was so character-oriented, all these character-oriented things, right? To go looking for searching for strings and things in your legal briefs. Now, I want to, you get, you got to get this image in your mind of a lawyer sitting down to an ASR33 teletype and typing in using a dot editor, creating macros for NROF and TROF text formatters. This is why a new job was created called legal secretary, okay? Somebody that could do that thing and they were pretty good. So Ken and Dennis got their PDP-11 but then all of a sudden they realized this is a completely different instruction set. So we have to rewrite the entire operating system again in assembler. And Dennis says, this is too much like work. I'm going to write this 
language called C, and then we would never have to rewrite the kernel again. And so they wrote, he wrote C, and then they rewrote the entire kernel in C. And everything was fine until somebody came along and says, hey, I have an Interdata 832. Could you put Unix on that? Sure. Oh my God. It's not quite as portable as we thought it was. And so now we're going to make Unix so that there's a part that's device independent, scheduling tasks, scheduling higher order memory scheduling, things like that, scheduling IOs and things. And then we're going to have a lower part, which is device dependent because it has to be. It's talking to controllers, it's talking to buses and things like that. And so Unix started to become more and more portable across hardware. And this was something that regular computer companies didn't think about doing because why should they? Why should they make their operating system work on somebody else's hardware? And so back in those days, as you went from company's hardware and system to company's system, you had to learn everything all over again because the computer was more expensive and more important than the programmer or the user. And what Ken and Dennis really did was they said, you know, computers are becoming faster and cheaper. Maybe human beings are more valuable than computers. And at first, Unix was distributed in source code. Ken loved going off to universities and sabbaticals and teaching at universities. He loved working with young people. And this also allowed universities such as Carnegie Mellon, you know, Columbia, Berkeley, to contribute ideas and things to this operating system. But Unix was never free. It was always licensed by AT&T. Ken would fling his source code tapes around, kind of loose with the, with the whole thing. But if you actually looked at the license, if you were not a research organization like Columbia or Berkeley or something, the price for Unix was $160,000 per CPU for the source, because that's the way it was distributed. But worse than that, you had to tell them the serial number of your computer. Now, how many of you know the serial number of your laptop? Slackers. <laughs> <laughs> Cell phone? Yeah, oh, lazy. But that wasn't the hard part. I mean, you could find that out, but find the person inside of AT&T to tell the serial number? Did you ever try and fight, call the telephone company? <laughs> Joe, have you ever tried to call Google? What's the telephone number of Google? There isn't any. <laughs> so, this was very difficult, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of people, but if you were one of these universities, Berkeley, Columbia, whatever, a research university, you got the operating system for $350 for a site-wide license, no matter how many computers you had. So that was a good deal. And everybody just started to work on this operating system for fun. Now, there were a lot of other contributions, many, many contributions that came out of Unix research and stuff like that. The concept that you, you separate the command line from the kernel and the libraries, a completely separate process, command interpreter called the shell. And a whole bunch of little utilities that all worked and did their jobs very, very well. And then there was this concept of pipes and filters generated by a very fine gentleman by the name of Douglas McElroy. Douglas was actually the, the laboratory director who hired Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie into Bell Labs, a very great guy. And he came up with this idea of pipes and filters and everybody, everybody working on the team said, what? It was so alien that he had to sit down and write some of the first Unix commands to demonstrate how pipes and filters would work. We've had lots of other things that have come about over time. Things like the portable network file systems, X window system client server developed at MIT, 
many more things that came out of this operating system research. In 1982, a small company out in California had a single board computer that was designed at Stanford University. This was a much cheaper computer system than the workstations of the day. And they decided they wanted to sell this. And they started going around to different companies and saying, you know, can we use this operating system? And well, the operating system of the day was CPM, you know, 64 bit, uh, sorry, 16 bit address space, very simple operating system, nah, too weak. BMS. They actually came to Digital in Massachusetts and asked Ken Olson, can we license your VMS operating system? And Digital said, no, we don't think so. Which is probably great because VMS was not very portable. And then they got the bright idea, let's use Unix and let's get our Unix from the University of California, Berkeley. But they still had this problem because they needed this $160,000 license. And so they went to AT&T and, and said, if we don't distribute the source code, if we only distribute binaries, can we get a cheaper license? And at and said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. $350 per machine. And you don't have to tell us the serial number. Oh, that's good because we don't have serial numbers. <laughs> and so they generated a two-user and a multi-user license for this and started selling these. And other companies that have been kind of dabbling in Unix started saying, well, we're going to develop our own Unix systems. And some of them chose the, the software from System 5, from AT&T directly. And some of them, most of them, took it from Berkeley. And one of the reasons for that was the Berkeley code uh, the System 5 code was a swapping type of operating system, meaning the largest program that you could have in memory was the size of memory itself. You were limited by the size of memory, maybe a little bit letter, bigger by using something known as overlays. But that was a limitation. But Berkeley had this thing called demand page virtual memory, which meant that you could have a program as big as your address space, no matter what your physical memory size was. That was nice. But another thing was the networking. System 5 had networking called UUCP, Unix to Unix copy. And so when you wanted to send email, you had to put into your, ad, your, your, your address every single system along the way. And that system would hop the messages from system to system, dialing it up, sharing the, mess, sharing the message, closing it down, storing it to the next one. But Berkeley had implemented TCP IP, and that made a lot of difference. So most of the people went with Berkeley as a thing. Now, there was one person who was not very happy with the concept of the binary-only software. And this person was Richard Stallman, who was at MIT as a student. And he was in charge of some of the systems they had. And he found out he couldn't implement this new printer driver because he didn't have the source code for the operating system. And he got so pissed off about this that he decided he was going to write an entire operating system in source code form and make it freely available to people. And he, did, he started the project anew in 1983. He started to get people to join with him and believe in this project. And in 1985, he founded the Free Software Foundation to help to guide this and keep it going. Now, he could have started writing the kernel first, but that would have meant that many years later, we'd be using a 1984 kernel in 2019. And that didn't make very much sense. There wouldn't have been any applications to run on top of this kernel. It wouldn't have been very useful. So instead, he started with something that almost every developer used, a text editor, Emacs. And a lot of people say he could have stopped with Emacs because after all, it is like an entire operating system, right? Schedules its own memory, schedules tasks, and everything else. But, you know, he continued on. And they developed a compiler suite 
the GNU compiler suite. And people started to understand something. I can use the same text editor whether I'm working on VMS or MVS or these different Unix systems. I can use the same text editor with the same finger marks. I can actually you know, create this text editor that I own. It works the way I want to. And I just have to copy it from place to place. And the same thing with the compiler suite that I can write the same C code with the same syntax and the same semantics on all these different operating systems. Yes, it may have different libraries I have to call, and he even created a, a set of libraries to go with that, so that your code could be almost the same. And this cut down not only on the complexity of your code, but also the complexity of the testing of your code. And people like Boeing, started to recognize this, and they started using GNU compilers, even though the GNU compilers were nowhere near as efficient as some of the commercial compilers. The VAC-C compiler, for instance, that ran on VMS could produce code that was about 30% more efficient than the GNU compiler suite in the early days. But Boeing said, well, thank you very much, DAC, but we'll just buy a faster CPU because the cost of us having all these different compilers with different syntax and semantics is too high. And then a, a small firm called Cygnus started up and said, hey, we're going to give support to this. And so there was support for free software. And Cygnus eventually was bought by Red Hat, and as we know, Red Hat was bought by another company. And other things started coming up. People would package some of this new software with CDs. And, and a friend of mine named Jim Joyce had this little Unix bookstore out in San Francisco. And when we had our Unix events, you would go to Jim Joyce's hotel room and he would have candles and wine and you would go through and look at all this great software and talk about the free software that came from GNU. And Prime, you know, prime time software, Young Minds, and, and bunches of others would create uh, contributions of all this software. O'Reilly started up publishing books on Unix and uh, made it more available. Now, my own company, Digital, we decided we were going to make a Unix system. We actually had several of them, a 16-bit system called uh, Ultrix 11. And then we had a 32-bit system called Ultrix 32. I joined in 1983. Yes, I admit to be very old. <laughs> and uh, it was based on BSD 4.1. And, you know, it was fairly successful, not completely successful, but it was a fairly good system. About this time, the Unix wars really intensified. And Sun Microsystems got together with AT&T and formed this organization called USL, Unix System Labs. And they would not let the other companies really join. They would say, well, we'll develop the technology and you guys can just port it to your systems. This didn't go over well with DEC, HP, IBM, and some others who, in 1988, formed the Open Software Foundation. And the Open Software Foundation had a different philosophy. We're going to create a set of standard APIs, and then we're going to test your version of your operating system to see if those standard APIs are followed properly. And we're also going to create a sample implementation of this in case there's a difference between the test suite and the standard itself. The sample implementation will be the final arbiter of how that operating system is supposed to work. We based it on CMU mock as the very basis of the kernel. That's a microkernel. But most people never used the microkernel because we couldn't get it to be efficient enough to replace a monolithic kernel. But what happened was, when you passed that test suite, you then had the right to call your operating system Unix, a brand, a thing of quality. Well, in 1991, there was this tiny little company called BSDI. And they decided they were going to take the Berkeley code and distribute the binaries and the source code for only $1,000. And that was really a, a good deal.
But AT&T came along, or USL, AT&T with USL, came along and said, oh no, we still have copyrighted code in that, and we're going to sue your butt. And they started this huge lawsuit against BSDI. They didn't sue the University of California, Berkeley. Well, number one, because Berkeley was not distributing it that way. But number two, it's very nasty to sue a university. And this dragged on for years and years and years and was finally settled in 1994 when a judge found that only 17 files in the BSDI distribution still had any AT&T code in it. And Berkeley said, oh, and they rewrote those 17 files and now there's no code. And BSD Lite was distributed as completely free code in 1994. However, in 1991, a young man at the University of, uh, at the University of Helsinki said, I'm going to have this project just for fun. I'm going to write a new kernel and people can join me and we're going to have, well, and it wasn't to write a free kernel. It wasn't to write a gratis kernel. In fact, he almost did not pick the GPL as a license. He didn't really care. He wanted to create a good kernel. But he was convinced that the GPL was the way of doing that to get the most people writing the kernel for him. And so they started. And by 1994, version 1.0 of the kernel came out. We'll see a little bit more about that later. Now, why could this development happen? in this period of 1991 to 1994, when it was hard to do this beforehand. You know, before this, you needed kind of like a centralized group to develop this stuff. And this was the development across the internet by people who never met each other face to face. Well, one of the reasons was that powerful, cheap computers had come out. The 386, the Intel, yeah, I know you're laughing because I normally describe these computers as these weak, miserable, crappy Intel processors. <laughs> but the 286 was a swapping type of system. The 286, the 186, the 8088, and so forth was a swapping type of system. They did not support demand page virtual memory. The 386 was the first computer from Intel that did. And the operating system that came with most of these weak, miserable, crappy Intel systems was developed by this company in Redmond, Washington, and it was supporting only a swapping system. And Linus didn't like this. He wanted a system that did support demand page virtual memory. He knew that Unix did this, but there was no Unix system that he could afford and would have, that was open. I mean, there was Minix. But nah, he didn't like Minix. And Minix was still going underneath of some maturations of proprietary stuff back in those days. So he decided he was going to start this new thing, supporting demand page virtual memory. And the 386, although his 386 was new to him, it was old enough in the development cycle that people were now starting to look at 486s, and they had these 386s that they could offload to this project that they were working on. Faster internet was coming to the house. It wasn't just your university. It wasn't just your uh, business. It was coming into your house so you could go home at night and work on this as a project. There was a lot of information online, white papers, and things like that. There was Minix you could look at. You could look at all this stuff and get ideas of how to build this kernel. And the World Wide Web was maturing, and they found out that they could use this for more than just pornography. <laughs> so in 1994, 10 years after George Orwell's 1984, version 1.0 of the Linux kernel was released. Now, for people who not, are not used to releasing software, before your software is really useful to the general public, you say, oh, it's 0.5 release 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, 0 0.99999. Linux was somewhere in that when in 1994 Linus finally said, okay, it's 1.0. And in 
and all of these different little vendors like soft landing systems and Yggdrasil and a fledgling Red Hat and a fledgling Debian decided to come out with distributions using the GNU software, MIT software, Berkeley software, putting it together in a package and making it available. And O'Reilly, who had stopped publishing books on Unix because he had started publishing books on Windows NT. He said, Unix is dying. I'm going to do stuff on Windows NT, how to program Windows NT, how to use Windows NT. I don't blame Tim for this because he had people working for him that depended on him, depended on his publishing house. But when Linux came out, he said, wow, this is what I'm going to put my, my thrust behind. And so he started publishing books on Linux. A lot of the system vendors had given up on Unix on the desktop. They had given that over to Microsoft a long time before, and Microsoft was bringing out Windows NT, challenging them in the server space, and they didn't like that. And then all of a sudden, this little operating system popped out of nowhere called Linux, or GNU Linux. I don't want to be insulting. <laughs> in May of 1994, that we were having one of these DECUS events. I was working for DEC, a user event, DECUS. It was going to be down in New Orleans. Now, as you know, there are two adult Disneylands in the United States. One of them is Las Vegas, and the other is New Orleans, particularly the French Quarter. You can get anything you want in the French Quarter and a lot of things you don't want. <laughs> and I happen to love the French Quarter. And a friend of mine kept sending messages out to these little companies and saying, hey, we'd like to bring this guy from Europe to Dicus in the French Quarter, and could you help us with the money for the trip? And they would write back and say, we're just a small company, we don't have much money, but we'd be happy to send you some CDs. And I'd never heard of this person. I'd never heard of this thing that this guy was talking about. But I went to my boss and I said, you know, I don't know who this guy is, I don't know what he did, but oftentimes Kirk, Kirk uh, has good ideas, and I think we should support this. So my boss went to their bosses and said, we don't know who this guy is, we don't know what he did, we don't even know who Kirk is, but Mad Dog sometimes has good ideas, and I think we should support this. So we got $5,000, bought this guy an airline ticket, and then Kirk said the unthinkable to me. I need to have an Intel PC to run this software on. And I said, Kurt, we make VAX systems. <laughs> we make MIPS systems. We make alpha systems. We don't make those weak, miserable, crappy Intel PCs. That's something that the PC division of digital makes, and I don't even talk to them. That's a toy system. I need it. Okay, I'll rent you one. So I flew down to New Orleans. There was Kurt trying to put this software onto this machine and having a horrible time. And along came this nice young man with sandy brown hair, wire rim glasses, wearing sandals and wool socks and said, can I help you? And Kurt looks at him and smiles and says, yes, I think you can. And about 10 minutes later, Linux was working on that PC. That was the first time that Linus had ever installed Linux from a CD. Because the way that Linus installed Linux was he had a spare disk that had everything except the kernel on it. And then he would build the kernel and put it on a disk and then boot that disk. And that's the way he installed it. He also couldn't do backups. The way he backed things up was let everybody else copy the kernel tree from him. <laughs> but... Uh, I looked at this and I said, this is really great. How many of you play a keyboard instrument of some type, particularly a piano? Yeah. If you tune a piano, you can usually typically get pretty good sound out of it. But if you play a really great piano, like a Yamaha or something like that, the keys are all even, they're all perfectly weighted. Your fingers just fly over it. It is a beautiful thing to play. 
Now, I worked on a lot of different Unix systems by that point. Digital Ultrix, Digital Unix, Solaris, Xenix, SCO Unix, whatever. I sat down to that system. It was like playing a Yamaha. And it was just beautiful. If you thought of it as Berkeley, it was Berkeley. If you thought of it as System 5, it was System 5. And this machine was responsive. And I said, and I pardon you if you're offended by this, I said, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to listen to some of Linus's talks. He gave two talks. And each talk, now remember, there's 19,000 people at this DECAS conference. 19,000 digital customers. Only 40 people came to each one of Linus's talks because nobody had heard of Linux from DEC. And poor Linus, he was sweating. Sweat was pouring off of his forehead, pouring off his, he was terrified of speaking in front of these 40 people. And I went and listened to it, and I understood what this was. And I took him out on the Natchez, the last steam-driven power boat going up and down the Mississippi River, and we were drinking these wonderful drinks on the bow of the boat. Their drinks were called hurricanes. <laughs> and that's because if you drink a couple of them, you feel like, feel like you've been hit by a tropical depression, Katrina, right? And we're up there, we're going to, we've had a nice dinner, we're listening to steam, calliope, and stuff like that. And I said, Linus, have you ever thought about porting Linux to a 64-bit computer? and a RISC processor to get the Intelisms out of the software. Now, for those of you who don't do a lot of programming, what is an Intelism? It's utilizing the hardware of the system to have a shortcut or as an accelerator. And that's wonderful, except it also makes your software less portable. And, I, and, and Leah says, yeah, I've been thinking about that, but the DEC office in Helsinki has been having problems in getting me an alpha system, and so I may have to do the IBM PowerPC instead. <laughs> ah! And I dropped my hurricane, and I never drop a drink, ever, ever, ever. And I said, don't do anything, ha don't do anything rash. And I went running back to digital the next day, got to my office, and I called up a friend of mine named Jim Jackson. Jim Jackson was in charge of alpha seed units because we'd just come out with the alpha. It was still rare. Some of our engineers didn't have an alpha system of their own. They had to do this by being in a, in a lab with earphones working on the alpha. We had these seed units we were sending out to developers to get their code ported over to digital Unix. And also remember, these systems were not $400 systems or even $1,000 systems. This was a $30,000 system. And I said, Jim, you don't know who this guy is. You don't know what he did, but I need to have this system sent to Helsinki, Finland right away. I mean, right away. Now, people will tell you, and Amber gave a, a, a great talk today you know, about community and stuff. And she said, and I'll paraphrase this, it's often easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And so people will tell you that the way you get things done in a big company is you write a proposal, you send that to your management, management looks at it, says what is the cost of everything, what's the benefits, pass it up their line, nothing ever gets done. That's not how you get things done. You call in favors. <laughs> and by that time, I've been working for Linux, I've been working with DEC, a DEC for 16 years, and there was a lot of people who owed me favors. <laughs> and I started pulling them in, and Jim Jackson was one of them. I said, Jim, I need to have this unit sent. What just so happens, he had one underneath his desk. It had just come back, and so he sent it to Helsinki, Finland. Remember, it's $30,000. He said, what are you going to pay for? I said, I'll pay for the shipping. And we sent it, and, that, and it was being sent without this very interesting thing called a loan of products form, which was going to say to Linus Torvalds, protect this system, we want to have it back someday, stuff like that. We, did, we sent that system towards him without that form being filled out. In June of that year, he came to Boston to a Eustix conference. I put the, the loan of products form 
to him. He was eating a hot dog with one hand and signing it with the other and saying, do I ever have to send this system back? I said, Linus, I've worked for digital for 16 years. I've never seen anybody return a Luna Products system. I think you've got the system forever. So I then started looking around deck. I found out that my digital Unix engineers have been using Linux for like six months because they didn't have a laptop with an alpha on it, but they had Linux. And they could go out and sit in their hammock underneath their tree in the summertime and program on Linux on their laptop and then bring the code in and compile it for the alpha system. And I knew that something was going to be good. And I found some other engineers inside of digital that were also looking at different operating systems and independent of me, they had selected Linux as the one. And then we started the port. Linus actually started the port on January the 1st, 1995. It took up until that time for him to figure out how to structure the code for the tree. And he started the port January the 1st. And by November of 1995, Red Hat had come out with an Alpha Linux distribution on CD. This was the fastest I'd ever seen a port of a major operating system, and it was done by people who never saw each other face to face. Well, it had the same problem that lots of other operating systems, hardware combinations did. There were no applications, no applications for it. But remember, the web had exploded. And so there was a series of people called ISPs, Internet Service Providers, that had systems, accounts they had, which were basically just a Solera system with a, a Spark Solera system. And people would log into it and run shell scripts and compile programs and things like that. And they were pretty expensive. But this weak, miserable, crappy Intel PC with this wonderful operating system on it could give you the same functionality for about one third of the price. And almost overnight, lots of people switched over. I still remember going to an ISP in Colorado. They had just finished porting, getting Solaris on all 3,000 of their server systems. And I showed up and said, you know, you can save a lot of money with Linux and Intel. And the guy said, well, I appreciate that, but it's taken us two years to get it to all the machines running the same version of Solaris on Spark. Maybe in the future we'll think about this. And as I was leaving, his boss came into the room and he introduced me to his boss. That was a mistake. And I said, well, nice to meet you, sir. And I turned back to my friend and I said, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're ready to start saving money with Linux, let me know. And I walked out. And I heard his boss say behind me, what do you say about saving money? What? What? And Linux allowed you to repurpose old machines instead of just throwing them out as useless junk you could have them do some other useful task and then have your new machine free to do whatever you wanted to with it. In 1994, BayOF supercomputers were invented. We'll talk more about those in a moment. In 1998, the databases, Sybase, Oracle, Informix, all started to port to Linux. And from my experience with other operating systems in the past, I knew that this was the path that Linux had been accepted by that point. That some, a company like Oracle would put their, uh, their flagship op, uh, database on top of Linux. In the year 2000, embedded systems sprung up and almost overnight, Linux became the most used operating system in embedded system designs. Why? Because up until that point, you had little companies invent their own operating systems, put it on a little box, use it for controlling, use it for elevators, stuff like that. But all of a sudden, these companies said, or the, the customers of these companies said, we want to talk these systems over the internet. Oh my God. <laughs> that means we have to have a TCP IP stack. Those are hard. Oh my God, it means they have to be secure. Oh my God. Oh my God, they want us to use not just Intel chips, but Motorola chips and, and ARM chips and stuff. That means new compilers. That's a lot of work. Oh, wait a minute. 
There's one operating system that supports all of that, and it's free. And so almost overnight, they started, you know, they still had their proprietary systems, but they started using Linux for a lot of new things. Now, as I said, in 1994, we had this little problem. Companies like ECL and Cray were going out of business. And we needed these companies because they produced supercomputers. Now, they were very expensive to design. They would design them, start to manufacture them, and they would probably sell five. One of them would be sold to the agencies that we dare not say their name. <laughs> Three would be sold to, universe, sold to universities, but the universities didn't have any money to pay for them. And one might actually be sold to a paying customer. And that just wasn't enough to sustain that business. But yet, we need supercomputers. NASA needed supercomputers for one particularly interesting problem. It's called fluid dynamics. And fluid dynamics is every place. Fluid dynamics is in this podium. You say, Mad Dog, that's not fluid, that's solid. But the heat going through the podium is fluid. Glass looks like it's a solid, but it's a supercooled fluid. The air is a fluid, the sea is a fluid, the earth is a fluid, everything is fluid. And we need to solve these problems, and they're incredibly intensively computing intensive. So two people, Dr. Thomas Sterling and Donald Becker, came up with the concept of breaking these problems down to very small problems on commodity, inexpensive, weak, miserable, crappy Intel PCs or other commodity computers manufactured in large quantities, and then bringing the answer all together at the last moment. And this is, this is one at Oak Ridge National Labs, 512 cast-off computers that had already been replaced. They carried them into the room. They put them sophisticated networking out the back and it created a supercomputer to actually solve and do real work. Today, all 500 of the fastest computers in the world run Linux. Over the years, there were two of them that ran Microsoft, basically because Microsoft paid them to run Microsoft. And, but they kept going further and further and further down the list of the 500 fastest. And recently, they just fell off the end because it was too expensive to keep them going to be on that 500 list. Although also interesting, that prize the Gordon Bell Prize. Gordon Bell was one of the designers of RSX, the PDP-11, VAX, and VMS. He went to work for Microsoft in their supercomputing research department, and the High Performance Computing Organization named a prize for performance and price performance after Gordon Bell. Microsoft has yet to win that. <laughs> And I call up Gordon every once in a while and say, Gordon, how does it feel to have a prize named after you, but your company has never won it? He says, ah, he says I don't care. <laughs> he had his money. But now it's been a number of years, and every year we talk about the Unix or Linux desktop. And we've never quite gotten there. You know, at first there was a standard and I'm sure you've recognized it, or maybe your parents have done it, where they have this notebook and they write down every single thing that they're supposed to type into the system to do it. And that's because they had this one interface called Microsoft Windows on the desktop. And you know that's the way they worked. They didn't learn what those things did. They only learned, this is what I'm supposed to type to get it to do it. And so, Another system coming along, they didn't want to learn it, right? It's too hard for them. There's also a lack of games. Now, one of, and, and this is a big reason for people not using Linux. I mean, I, I find this hard to believe because I'm not a gamer, I'm not. And for people to say to me, I'm not going to use Linux on my desktop because I need a game, it's, it's hard for me to understand, but that's okay. The issue with games, 
is that Linux has about, or back in the early days, 3% of the desktop. Apple had 7% of the desktop, Microsoft had 90% of the desktop. And so if you're a game developer, you want to develop your games to the largest market, particularly because of another factor. Brazil pirates 84% of their software. China used to pirate 96% of their software, but the World Trade Organization got them down to only 84%. Vietnam pirates 99% of their software. That's bad enough. But when you go into gaming, in gaming, 99% of the software is pirated. Somebody buys one copy of it and all their friends say, let me copy it, let me copy it, let me copy it, right? That's a terrible thing. And if you now mark that 1% of the people actually pay for their games, and you apply that to 3% of the desktop, that's a very small number of games you're going to sell for, for going over cross. Of course, the gaming community does things like create game consoles, which brings in more money, and you, you can't really pirate a game console. It is because of computer games that we have copyright on software. Back in the day where the game was put into the ROM, competitors would just simply copy the ROM and create their own version of the game. And that's where software copyright was first applied. The other reason why people don't use Linux is because they say, hey, I only need five applications. Well, the first application might be an office suite. That's easy, LibreOffice. Another application would be you know, a database. Well, there's a whole bunch of those. But then you get out there to the fifth application, and that's a little harder to find. But hey, it exists on Windows, so that's what I'm going to use. Now, things have changed because of one important thing, the World Wide Web, and the number of browsers that came out with different scroll bars, different button pushings and stuff, different ways of looking at it. And you could no longer just write down in your notebook what to push and what to prod to get your work done. You actually had to learn what these things do. And it broke that interface of Microsoft. Microsoft lost control of that. And now we have Android on the desktop, we have Apple on the desktop, and we have lots of other things. Speaking of Apple, Apple posed another threat because it used to be that computers were used for computing, and then you had televisions and stereo systems. Those were the consumer items, like refrigerators and stuff. And the number of televisions dwarfed the number of computers. Well, Apple came along and said, hey, we're going to make the computer a consumer item. We're going to sell it to everybody. Everybody's going to have a computer or two computers or three computers or 50 computers. And that started the path. And Apple said, we're going to create a phone. And we almost lost that. But then Google came along and invented Android. Now, if you ever study the Apple marketplace, you know that Apple only has one partner in computing, and that's Apple. If you're not Apple, or maybe an application developer, you're not going to make any money with Apple. You can't sell a disk drive to Apple. You have to buy an Apple disk drive. You can't sell a printer to Apple. You have to have an Apple printer, an Apple scanner, an Apple TV, an Apple everything. You have Apple stores. But with Android, if you could even say the word Android, you could put Android on your hardware. And so every other phone manufacturer other than Apple said, sure, we'll support your Android. And we'll give people different sizes and shapes and different thicknesses and sometimes a hard keyboard and sometimes just a soft keyboard and so forth and so on. And now Android is outselling iOS at least two to one. So I predict that in a few years, Apple will still own 7% of a very lucrative, very profitable market, and Android will have the other 90%. And now we have the cloud, where we can hide the OS and the libraries behind this thing called the cloud, the internet that was supposed to be distributed and supposed to survive atomic attack and all these things, has once again become centralized in AWS, 
or, you know, Microsoft's cloud or other people's clouds, Google's cloud. Sure, they have centers around the world, but the control is centralized in the United States. And people will lease cloud services to people. You'll get the illusion of privacy, but it's not private. And we live in a very strange environment. We live in the United States, which were protected by this wonderful piece of paper called the Constitution that protects our privacy because the British Army used to charge into people's homes without any type of subpoena. But if you live outside the United States, you have no rights. No rights at all. The government doesn't even have to go to a court to listen to your conversation. That's a problem. Because my friends down in Brazil, they're under Brazilian law and they're under U.S. law because their data is stored a lot of times in the United States. But we have to take back the cloud. We have to make sure that the cloud works for us. So the summary of history up until this point is that Unix created portable code and portable people across hardware boundaries. It set the APIs for the future, most of which is in this very relatively small kernel. There's 154 programming interfaces to the kernel, 154 system calls to do things for you. There's over 10,000 library calls, which is where the real functionality happens. GNU Linux rewrote this, reignited this, and gave back a lot of the control of the hardware to you. Not completely. There's still a lot of binary blobs out there in firmware for devices that could hold malware in them. The BIOS is a freaking mess and holds all sorts of really horrible stuff. We need to fix that. We need to spread the concept of free and open source software and hardware and culture. We need to be able to, to teach people how to use Creative Commons, what the goodness is of it, business plans around that. When I first started working with Linux, my managers at DEC questioned my sanity how in God's name can you sell an operating system and make money, a free operating system and make money? And they laughed at me. And now all of them work for IBM. <laughs> <laughs> so I was asked, besides the history of this, to talk about the future. We are in a wonderful place right now. But we have a lot of users out there that know nothing about software freedom. They use their Android phone, they punch in their applications and stuff like that. They don't know or care about freedom and we have to educate them. Some companies I've been told love open source. I've dealt with them for a long time. Notice that they don't say that they love Linux. They love open source. What's the difference? Open source protects the developer. Open source gives rights to the developer, to the company using the code that other people have written. Free software gives that support to the end user, gives the protection to the end user. I have a drawer full of little computers that I can no longer use because the company that made them going out of business and they use firmware that I can't replace. Let's talk about love for just a second. In the ancient Greek, there was three types of love. There was agape, the love of God for humans, the love of mother for children. But even the love of mothers is not without a cost. If you love me, you'll take out the garbage. If you love me, you'll feed the dog. But your mother will still love you. Agape, the greatest love. Then there's philos, from which we get philosophy, philosophy, philanthropy, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. 
Philos is a love of friends for one another. But then we have Eros, the deepest, dirtiest love, <laughs> the sexual love, from which we get the word erotica. Some of these companies love free software on the Eros level. Don't bend over in the shower <laughs> and wear your condoms. We are close to world, world domination. The 500 fastest computers in the world run Linux, most used in embedded system design. 60% of the world's servers are being shipped with Linux. The desktop is actually now 10%, installed base, 10% Linux. And it's selling through Android and Chromebooks and things like that at a much higher rate. We are close, but you have to keep fighting. You have to make people understand the business models around free software, that you can make money with free software, and that the goodness of software for the public use. If you pay for software in your taxes through the government or through education, you should have the right to use that software without having to pay for it again. You need to talk about free and open source all the time. Be a pain about it. Make it so that people run away from you when you come. <laughs> because you're the front line. You're the front line, right? You have to talk to your politicians, your educators, K through 12. There's plenty of software out there to teach kids K through 12. University. We should have, you know, there's no reason why university students, particularly in computer science and computer engineering, should not be using open source. No reason. Maybe 25 years ago, there was a reason. Because when you went out to SourceForge, you'd find out that there was 13,000 applications out there and 1.3 million people adding to it. But now when you go to GitHub, there's 430,000 applications and 26 million people contributing to it. And there's almost an application for almost anything you can do. And you don't have to use all of the application. You can use a portion of it as long as you obey the license. Industry, bring products to market faster, cheaper. Why should you be paying for something when you can get all the functionality you need for free and if you need to make changes to it, you can hire a local programmer to do the work. I tell people the United States is actually 50 small countries. I live in the small country of New Hampshire. We only make two things in New Hampshire, maple syrup and software. And I'm tired of sending all my money for software to the small country of Redmond, Washington, or Silicon Valley. I am, quite frankly, tired of that, especially when I have software programmers out of work. And so I say, let's keep the work here, because those programmers will then buy local food, local housing, and pay local taxes. We should all be thinking like that. And next year, I want you to bring two Windows programmers to the Ohio Linux Fest. How many of you have ever heard the story of the invention of the checkerboard? A king in China wanted a new game, and a mathematician said, I'll invent a new game, I'll invent a new game for you. It's going to be a board with these little squares on it. But what I want, and he invented the board, and the king was so impressed with it, he said, how can I repay you? He said, I want two grain, one grain of rice in the first square, two in the second, four in the third, and so forth and so on. The king said, yes, your wish is granted. The king was not a mathematician. Because <laughs> by the time he got to the 64th square, there wasn't enough rice in China to pay for it. So if we do the same thing, you people bring two Windows users to OFL next year, and then they bring two Windows users to OOF the year after that, and they bring two... In 10 more years, we will have world domination. <laughs> These are some of the projects I'm working on. The Linux Professional Institute is ongoing. We're, forming, we're going to form a membership 
become a membership organization so that you people will be able to determine the, di the direction that we're going in the future. I write and blog for various magazines. Caninos Lucos is a project I have down in Brazil because the Raspberry Pi, due to customs duties, costs about $120 down in Brazil. So we're designing and manufacturing computers down there. People told me it's impossible, it will never happen. I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> this is another little computer that we designed and are manufacturing in Brazil. It uses an ARM M4 processor, it has 256 kilobytes of RAM, 512 kilobytes of flash, and it runs Linux. It has little sensors around the outside. It runs off of a watch battery for about six months, getting the batteries, it's a year. Have an Uber capacitor and a solar panel, it's indefinite. Uses Bluetooth mesh or LoRaWAN to communicate. LoRaWAN will transmit up to 10 kilometers. Not very fast, but that's okay. I have another project, Project Kawa, which helps university students afford university. We talk a lot about students these days and the horrible charges that they have from the university courses. In Latin America, most of the universities are free of tuition. Federal and state universities are free of tuition. But 40% of the students who qualify to go still cannot afford it because their families are too poor to afford the, house, the apartment, the transportation, the computers, the internet, and so forth. So Project Kawa teaches these students how to use the technical skills they already have to set up their own business. We create a contract, a skeleton contract for them, skeleton advertising materials. We teach them how to sell. We approach businesses. And what we do is we align the students with six businesses. And the students give them four hours a week, every week, to do things on their systems. Look at the error logs, see if their disk is about to fill up, make sure their Wi-Fi is secure, apply patches to the thing, find new software for them to use. And those, by working 24 hours a week, these students will be able to afford university. And then finally, there's my retirement project, plus BS, which I'll get to in a moment. Here's Caninos Lucos, the little computer we call the flea. All of our computers are named after dogs. Caninos Lucos means crazy canines. <laughs> mm, plus BS. Mad Dogs Monastery and Marina of math, music, microcomputing, microbrewing, microwinery, microdistillery. And here at OOF, I added micro mansions because somebody suggested that. Tiny houses micro mansions and bait shop because if you have a marina you obviously need a bait shop <laughs> this is my retirement project where we're going to teach open source and open culture to graduate students who want to learn it's opening in 2025 you're all welcome and finally I've had a lot of people talk about what I've done for OOF and people come up to me and say thank you very much because I listened to you 10 years ago and now I'm the CTO of my company or I listened to you 20 years ago and now I'm the CEO of my company and I employ 60 people and all of this makes me feel very, very good. But if you want to see the most important person in free software, then when you get up tomorrow morning, you look in the mirror because it's you. You are the most important people in free software. It's a terrible responsibility. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Please sit down.